Florida has faced a surge of lithium-ion battery incidents tied to hurricanes, specifically noticed with electric vehicles. Starting with Ian in 2022 and again with Helene and Milton in 2024, I spoke with Chief Rice, director of the Florida Division of State Fire Marshal's Office, about the growing challenges in their efforts to track and tackle this dangerous trend. It seems like 2022, that's really where you notice that you might have an issue with electric vehicles and just lithium ion batteries in the state of Florida when it comes to hurricanes. Is that pretty accurate? That's very accurate. I will say in 2022, it really brought it to the forefront. We started uh, seeing EV fires post Hurricane Ian. And we had a lot of um, conversations about, oh, we think this EV fire during the storm caused a house fire. And we were trying to track some of those things down. But actually, while well, my boss, the CFO and state fire marshal, Jimmy Petronas, was out in southwest Florida, he was riding with a fire department. And they responded to an EV fire. And while he was there, you know, they, he saw the difficulties that they had. And the department said, hey, it's taken us 6, 10, 20,000 gallons of water to put these fires out. And as uh, he saw that, we started seeing more and more of those fires. And during Hurricane Ian, we ended up with, with 22 incidents. A couple of those were multiple incidents where that, you know, be on fire at the house and then they put it on the back of the tow truck and be on fire on the tow truck and then they'd get it to the salvage yard and it would be on fire at the salvage yard that they just never really did get it out but that really put uh i will say as a whole lithium ion batteries on the radar for the state of florida and one interesting case that i found uh about 308 days after the fact was uh one of one of your vehicles that made it all the way out to california on those flood damage and caught on fire that was pretty amazing uh, to hear about that one. We were tracking uh, most of the vehicles that were registered in the state and all the cars that were given certificates of salvage and certificates of destruction. We had all those VIN numbers. We were working closely with the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles to be able to identify those because we wanted to make sure that, one, we knew what, what was happening with them and where they were going just in case we you know, had fires and we could track it down. Uh, our biggest worry after the storm really was these things getting on container ships and getting, getting on fire out in the sea because we knew that that's where they were going to go. They were going to gobble up all these things and they'd all go to other other countries. Right. We, we worked with the Coast Guard to try to identify those. And I will say, fortunately, you know, we did not get any notifications of that happen, but that was the biggest, biggest worry that I had. Now, just in general, after a hurricane prior to EVs, were vehicle fires really a, a big thing? You know, I know they were going on and because we know that that even a, 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 an ice vehicle is subject to that saltwater inundation and can create some problems over time. But, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't on the radar. It was like, hey, wow, this is a big, terrible issue. Um, I think we had some of those vehicle fires and we continue to have those, but not in the amounts we had with um, the electric vehicles. I think part of it is you, you roll up to a, a traditional ice vehicle fire. It's, it's over in a matter of 10, 15 minutes. So it's exactly right. typically not that big of a deal. I mean, that's something we do every day. We go to car fires, right? You know, that's that's easy. Now, I did see in a presentation from NISTA, they estimated somewhere between three to 5,000 registered EVs in the storm surge uh, back in Ian in 2022. But the biggest thing there is, I, I, I just want to get your opinion on this. That doesn't mean all three to 5,000 of those were affected. A lot of those may have evacuated. They might have not actually been in the storm surge. Yeah, that's correct. So again, we worked with Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles and looked at registration data and overlaid that with the storm surge, the actual storm surge. We did it within 50 foot of the registration uh, information so we could identify how many were registered in the area. Now, that doesn't account for uh, rentals. That doesn't account for car lots. That doesn't account for people that stayed during the storm. So we knew somewhere around 4,000 vehicles were potentially in the area of the storm surge during Hurricane Ian. What I'm seeing is about 168,000 EVs were registered in the state of Florida back in 2022. Um, so overall, that's not a huge number of electric vehicles affected, which is really a, a good thing. As far as the fires go, it, really any battery-related fire in 2022, were you really tracking the data back then? I will say anecdotally, we were getting calls and we were trying to uh, get information out about how to uh, respond to these fires because we just didn't know it was so new and we had uh, had a webinar with the IFC and um, some of the, the subject matter experts in the field at the time to try to uh, give them some basically some uh, best practices and tactics on fighting these fires but we also put out what was a lithium-ion survey that we would ask them to uh, put that information in 
but we knew that most of the folks were they're busy, you know, and then to go into infers and then go into this other report, you know, a, a second step most often wasn't going to happen and whether that translated down to the streets. So I think it was highly underreported um, as far as the overall uh, lithium ion battery fires. Currently, we've we've been pushing that out. We've seen more response and I've got on my website a um, lithium ion battery fires. And then I've got one that specifically outlines the uh, saltwater inundation that were impacted by saltwater and the fires related to that. And I will say for uh, Hurricane Helene and Milton, we've seen about 80 different types of fires from golf carts to handheld batteries to, to EVs. And then 15 of those were uh, electric vehicle related. One of my frustrating things with Enfers is we, we already have to do fire reports, but it doesn't really capture the data around EVs or lithium ion battery in general. So that's one area I think the fire service needs improvement. We should be getting improvement hopefully here pretty soon. And I think that's that's what was the onus for getting this lithium ion battery survey out. But it's like I said it's it's a second step. And I it, while I've got some information, I know it's not complete. It, there's just no way that we're capturing that. We did uh, actually attach that kind of the plus one on most of the vendors and the instant reporting software that's out there. We've asked those within the state so that if somebody goes in and says it's a battery fire, it'll kind of point you to hey. If it's a battery fire, if it was related to this, go in and fill out this survey. So that makes it easier. It's more seamless. You don't have to go out of your incident reporting system and go into another system. But I know that that's still not um, consistent across the state, that they haven't updated their software or not every company's doing it, and, you know, just like that. So we still allow for a, a QR code or a link to the website so that people can upload that information. But it's slow and, like I said, inconsistent. But it's it's a whole lot better than what we've had. It at least gives us a snapshot of some of the fires that we're having. You see a lot of different municipalities or states when they start tracking or trying to track lithium ion battery fires. They're realizing they have a lot more than than they even even realize. So but I, I was just gonna say we just had a fire here in Tallahassee uh, at a at a hotel where a, a family was using a scooter and they'd brought it in the, into the hotel to um to to charge. And it caught on fire, and I believe we ended up flying out four individuals with injuries, significant injuries from from that fire. That's not in our database. So we, as we hear about them, we try to reach out to those departments and kind of give them a little tickler. Hey, please update this information in the lithium ion survey so we can capture that. I think what most people don't realize, the data that does exist out there today for most of the world is just people scraping the media and trying to find these media reports and, and get the data that way. So we, right. we really do need to do a better job. I think we're probably realistically probably four years out from having at least a, a snapshot of what's going on. Right. I would agree. Yeah. With the last two hurricanes we had in 2024 here, Helene and Milton, um, I see you had about 254,000 EVs registered in the state. Uh, about how many were you able to track down that were registered in the area of the uh, storm surge? So... We haven't done the, all the deep dive into the data for for Milton and Helene because they were back to back and we'd gotten really busy. But before the storm, we actually did this. We looked at what the potential storm surge areas, and it looked like we were around you know a little over seventy one thousand potential storm surge vehicles. Um, I still have to do an overlay to get to that that more fine tuned number of where exactly the storm surge did land, and it's within fifty foot of that registered vehicle. And I think we'll probably, I mean, it's probably going to be somewhere between ten and 12,000 vehicles uh, once I look at that. Okay. And that's just vehicles that are registered in that area. That doesn't mean that they were actually in the area at the time of the storm surge. So I that's, think that's an important distinction. I just, we wanted to make sure that we had an idea of what the potential could be and then really make sure that we were messaging to, hey, we know the vehicles that are there. Make sure you're taking them with you. Make sure you're unplugging them. Make sure you're moving them to higher ground whatever we can do to get that message out for folks. Yeah, one neat thing I kind of saw was uh, in Tampa, they were actually opening up parking garages for electric vehicles to put them up in higher ground, allowing people to park there for free during the, the storm and the evacuation. Well, we started uh, working with the Division of Emergency Management. We, a we asked them to uh, identify some locations actually along I-75, not only for charging of electric vehicles, but for staging locations for electric vehicles. And we had identified a couple of locations where people could get them out of the area 
leave them in a parking lot at a you know at a, at a mall or shopping area, and and leave them there while they you know move on to a, a hotel, you know just so that they can get it out of those areas when they evacuate. Because we had a a huge number of people that evacuated the areas that heeded the notices, which was really great. Yeah, it was good to see the messaging. I was actually had fortunate to help out with some of that messaging uh, around that and and get you a kind of one pager. Uh, it was good to see that spreading around and and really getting the word out. Now, as far as EVs that were, now there are 15 fires that we know of up to this point. How many actually were destroyed in the in the hurricane? Right now, we have for uh, vehicles that have certificates of salvage and certificate of destruction, kind of two different levels. Um, we have just around 890 of them uh, just uh, that we, we issued those certificates for. Okay, and that's electric vehicles and hybrids, correct? Yes, it is. Now, is there any way to discern like what type of battery chemistry? Obviously, like electric vehicles, your plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, those are going to be lithium-ion. But when you start talking about hybrid, it could be the safer nickel chemistries or lithium-ion. So any way to know? I don't. We're not tracking that unless we looked at the vehicle or knew what, knew what each one of those vehicle makeups were, which I'm sure we have the information, but we haven't dug into it that far. Overall, do you, did everybody feel a little bit more prepared going into uh, these two hurricanes? I, I actually really think that we they did that the uh, the communities the fire departments you know we were pushing good information out and there's a much higher awareness of the issues around the, the electric vehicles and and lithium ion batteries as a whole and so I think people really did uh, respond appropriately trying to move their vehicles and uh, to get them out of harm's way and and a big part of the messaging was don't come back plug your vehicle in and drive it off somewhere you know they 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 knew that that once uh, it had been saltwater and aid to, to reach out to their manufacturer or their their uh, local mechanic and, and have it looked at or have it, you know, dealt with, not just use it. And it wasn't actually just EVs. I know that's a big focus a lot of the times, but you had uh, about 79 other things that caught on fire that were lithium ion battery related. Um, golf carts, laptops, e-bikes, e e-scooters. Um, so there was quite a few different things. So I was out in um, in Pinellas County, out on Treasure Island, just post Hurricane uh, Helene, and we were going through the neighborhoods, and we had all the sand that was washed up on the shores and on the streets, and we were walking the neighborhoods, and I met up with a with a homeowner there who was pretty distraught, but we were talking to him about lithium ion batteries. Hey, make sure that you know if you've got any of these, get them out in your front yard so we don't have any you know structure fires, right? But get them out on the on the driveway and get him out of the house and he looked at me and he said oh i've already had a fire my my e-bike caught on fire and it's sitting in the driveway and he points at it he goes but it didn't extend to the house you know it caught on fire just post the storm and then you know he had moved it outside and uh, that just really highlighted how many of those are out there that we probably we're, we're completely unaware of that they happened at a fire unfortunately didn't you know extend into a structure or anybody was injured now, after a hurricane, and especially back to back like this, it must have been really difficult. But after a hurricane, you see all the piles of of waste on the side of the road waiting to get picked up. You know, people are kind of gutting their houses, removing their belongings to throw them out. Did you have any issues in the waste stream with batteries making it into that? Well, I think we're still seeing some of that now that they are having fires. That again, one of the messagings that we started putting out after Helene when we knew Milton was coming. And that we had all that debris was, hey, you know, if you do have lithium ion batteries of any sort, try to get them in a non-combustible container and get them separated or uh, when, especially when they were doing the debris pickup, because that was a big push from the Division of Emergency Management to get the crews out there and pick up this waste that's on the side of the road so that we get them in areas that are separated. Because we knew once the storm came in, all that stuff was going to be co-mingled and we'd have a big issue. So, uh, so right now, it sounds like we're reasonably successful, um, but I still think that we're seeing in in uh, recycling plants and waste uh, waste depots that we still are seeing some of these fires that they're responding to. And that's a struggle just in general. Even without a hurricane, we're still getting those batteries in the in the waste stream, in the recycling centers, and and causing fires. I I don't know what the answer to that is other than public education and just trying to push that message. Yeah, I think that's the biggest answer is we've got to push the message out that, hey, there's a separation. Make sure this goes to one place. Make sure uh, you know your day-to-day your, your -day waste goes to another location. 
but we've got to make it easier for the public, you know, that they know where those things are and that it's easy to get to them, get them, get them disposed of. So going forward, uh, I, I assume at this point, hurricane season's basically at the end. Do you have any thoughts in mind on what you might do different or how you're going to phrase messaging to the public? As 2025 season comes upon us, we'll probably start trying to get that stuff out earlier, not as the storms are coming out. Of course, nobody's really listening a lot at that point. But I think we're relying, as the, as the Division of State Fire Marshal, we're relying on our communities to make sure that they're carrying that message forward. And, and I think the, the, the key to that is, is the public education campaigns ahead of time and, and the recognition of the dangers of the batteries and, you know, while how, how important they are in our daily lives, but also how dangerous they can be when these things get inundated with salt water and or just day-to-day -day use of them and not abusing the batteries or abusing the the cords or making sure that they have the appropriate connections and stuff. I've had the opportunity to speak at your lithium ion battery symposiums in Florida. Could you share more about how those events have raised awareness and helped firefighters and first responders over the last few years? And I will say in 2023, when we had that, it was a, a pretty new thing. And uh, we were the only place having the lithium ion battery symposium. And I will say this past year in 2024, um, trying to get instructors. Oh, I'm going to this symposium. We'll go to that symposium. There were a lot of different trainings that were happening around the country, which was really, really good to see that their awareness is not just in Florida, but it's starting to pick up around the country because we need to, we need to have awareness for our communities and we really need to make awareness for our firefighters so that they continue to get the things that they need and understand how to fight these types of fires and what the dangers are of it. So um, I'm glad to see that the awareness has picked up across the country. Yeah, and it's not just the awareness. There's a lot of a uh, lot of studies going into the battery fires as well as e especially the EV fires to really understand um, what the fire department can do and the best way to handle these types of fires. Right. Well, we did. I, I think you know we had talked about this, but we did an EV research project this summer with the University of Miami in North Carolina, looking at the impacts of health and environment, but also best practices. Uh, how do you decon your gear? Going through all those things, and I'm really excited to get our results. Of that, I know they've been working through it, but we've been getting some of that information in. But uh, once we get it all together, we'll share it. And you know, I think the the idea is that everybody's doing a lot of research that we can kind of commingle this stuff and really get a better picture of how to handle these things and what the impact is. Yeah, speaking of research, I didn't mention earlier, but uh, NISTA did a vehicle study from 2022 uh, looking at flooded electric vehicles and trying to understand why they were catching on fire. Um, so we just recently got the paper on that. I know I, I, I haven't had time to digest it. I think it's like 120 pages worth of report. So it'll be interesting to see, uh, what came out of that. Well, so that report specifically is that, that we had worked with NHTSA and DOT during Hurricane Ian, and they ended up picking up 10 vehicles that were in salvage yards from Hurricane Ian and taking them back and studying them. And I think, yeah, the, the information we're going to get out of that is going to be invaluable. And what I hope happens with that is that the manufacturers use that information to make the vehicles safer when they know that there's a possibility of this uh, saltwater inundation. Hopefully this will drive some much needed change in the industry. I do look forward to covering this study in a, a future video. Overall, thanks for taking the time to share this valuable information with me. It's been a great conversation. Well, great. Well, Captain Duran, I appreciate you uh, uh, speaking with me today and covering this important topic and, and, uh, and the work that you continue to do to make our fire service community safer and our communities safer. So thank you.